good morning again, church. Hey, before we get started this morning, I just want to take a moment and draw your attention to our altar space up here this morning. Um, Gene Abshire and Marilyn Dugan always do a fantastic job of decorating. So, yeah. And Jean asked me a couple weeks ago, she said, hey, you're starting a new sermon series. What are you thinking? And I said, hey, it's called Street Smarts. And she's like, yeah. And I was like, that's as far as I got. <laughs> um, and so they did a fantastic job. And one of the things that I love is Jean actually had some of these made. Um, so this is actually like a real sign, real reflective sign right here. Um, and this is just, I love this one. This is fantastic. And this one right here just cracks me up. I don't know if you can see, it says, whoa. Imagine pulling up to a stop sign and it says, Whoa, right? I mean, do you stop or do you not stop? I don't know, but that's fantastic. I love that one. But this one right here, I just got a question. Don't the musicians control the tempo? So I'm not sure quite what this sign's saying. So just process that, right? But if you don't get it, it's Abbey Road. There's the Beatles walking on the deal on the bottom. So anyways... So special thank you to Gene Abshire and Marilyn Dugan uh, for our beautiful altarscapes this morning. Well, today, as I said, we are starting a brand new sermon series that I believe can have an impact on the lives of each person here today and the lives of each of those of you who are watching online as well. You see, there has never been a greater need for a series like this than now because far too many people are living in a day, living day in and day out by making foolish decisions without thinking about them. Now hear me clearly, it's not that our world is not intelligent, right? I'm not saying that at all. In fact, it's actually quite the opposite. Most people I know are highly educated and very bright. Amen. <laughs> are you speaking for yourself? Or are you, what are we? There's times the amen works, and there's times it doesn't. So we'll talk after service, all right? Those aren't the kind of smarts that we're talking about, though, for this series, right? So you see, we're not talking about book smarts. We're talking about street smarts. And that's what my dad used to call it. He used to call them street smarts, right? And so these are, we're talking about, there's the book smarts, right? That's the formal education. That's the formal training. And then there's street smarts, right? Lessons learned by doing life or, or what we basically call common sense, right? It's a little bit of common sense. So, so hear me clearly. You can possess both of these equally. You can. Or you can be heavy in one and very light in the other. But for the purpose of this series, we're going to be talking about those street smarts that, and specifically about the common sense that can come from God. So we're talking about this one word called wisdom. Wisdom. So as we begin talking about wisdom, let's start with a definition. We all need to be on the same page because honestly, we all think we know what wisdom is, right? No amen on that one, Terry? I was waiting for an amen on that one. We all know, right? <laughs> Some of you. Okay, well, now I'm going to challenge that, right? Well, wisdom as defined by the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary is A, ability to discern inner qualities and in judgment. Ability to discern inner qualities in, excuse me, inner qualities in relationships, aka insight, right? So it's insight. B, good sense. Judgment, right? So there's good sense. That's judgment. C, generally accepted belief. You know, this is the collective wisdom of the group, if you will. And D, accumulated philosophical or scientific knowledge, or excuse me, learning or knowledge, right? So wisdom is the combination of insight, judgment, and knowledge, right? Insight, judgment, and knowledge. And this is what we pull from to make life decisions when the rubber meets the road. Maybe that's why they call it street smarts. Don, why weren't you up here for that rim shot, man? We you... <laughs> have to work that out. But I think you already know this, but we live in a time of unprecedented growth in human knowledge. From an article in, on, on, on human knowledge in Industry Tap written by David Schilling, it says that not only is human knowledge on average doubling every 13 months, we are clicking on our way with the help of the internet to the doubling of knowledge every 12 hours. That's where we're headed, every 12 hours. Now, there's some, some statistics that went with this, and Google only processes about 0.4% of what's actually out on the internet, okay? So just understand that, right? We're on our way with the help of the internet to doubling knowledge every 12 hours. Let's put this into context, okay? In 1900, human knowledge doubled approximately every 100 years. 
There'll be 100 years to be another, another uh, advancement in, in human knowledge. By the end of 1945, the rate was every 25 years. Okay, there's a lot that happened between 1900 and 1945, right? We started flying. Cars became an everyday transportation item, right? So we start to see this, this change and this, this fastness that's, that's approaching us in our knowledge. This is why it's called the knowledge doubling curve. It was created by Buckminster Fuller in 1982. And so as you can see, knowledge is absolutely everywhere. But hear me very clearly, church. Not all knowledge is true. If you don't believe me, read five different articles on the internet about one certain thing. They're all going to say something different. Okay? Not all knowledge is true. And not all knowledge translates into success. I have a ton of knowledge about the Chicago Cubs. That does not help me in my daily life. <laughs> you see, even with doubling of our human knowledge every 13 months or, or moving into 12, 12 hours, you see, I kind of believe that our world is bankrupt in wisdom. And without wisdom, the, that once again, wisdom is the connection of insight, judgment, and knowledge, we're going to experience the pain of unnecessary mistakes. You see, I also believe that God desires for us to live in line with the way that he has created the world to work. I also believe that God wants us to live a full and blessed life. But those intentions are greatly threatened when we live carelessly, when we live without wisdom. A little after I turned 15, I began looking for my first ride. You know, you start getting that 16, you start getting that bug, you want your first ride, and you want it to be awesome. After realizing that my savings would not afford a Porsche 911 <laughs> or a Jaguar XJ220, or an Aston Martin DB5. Still take any one of those cars. I began to lower my standards. And I told my family that I had $2,000 in my savings and I wanted to get as much vehicle as I could for the money. And within a week, my uncle found a 1982 Chevy S10 pickup. <laughs> a little bit of a difference, I know, I understand, right? But he brought it to my dad's shop in Newcastle where I was working. And I will tell you, I was hooked. That almost 10-year-old truck, was, it, was, it was a light gray and had this, this red interior. And I would tell you, I wanted it. I wanted it. I told my uncle that I would take it as it fit inside my price range. I didn't even drive it. Never even drove it. I just told him that I will have the money later that afternoon. I'm going to have it. It's going to be ready to go. I never even looked at another vehicle. And this is when my dad offered me some of that unsolicited fatherly wisdom. He told me, you know what? There are plenty of other vehicles out there and that I shouldn't jump on the very first one that I find. What if something better came along tomorrow? He asked me if I was prepared to learn how to drive a standard. This was a stick. I've never driven a stick before. So I, I had to learn how, to, was I ready to do that? He asked me if the engine had been checked out. What about the other mechanical parts of the truck? He told me the best thing to do was to wait, to wait, to do some research, to make sure that this was really the vehicle that I wanted. I mean, after all, I had almost a year before I had to take my driver's test. Now, I'll tell you, that's some sage wisdom right there. And I recognized in the moment, so, so I popped the hood and I looked at the engine and I said, yep, this is the one. That's what I want. Just a little backstory. Um, I had no idea what I was looking at when I popped the hood to look at the engine, but there was an engine there, <laughs> so that was good. I was good to go. That 1982 Chevy S10 was mine, and, and that's about the time that my dad gave me a nickname, Mr. Instant Gratification. That was my new nickname. Now, for the most part, that little truck was a good truck. It lasted me for about six years and three wrecks, a new complete front end due to one of the wrecks, a new rear quarter panel uh, due to another one of the wrecks, 17 clutch assemblies. <laughs> I used to keep two with me at all times, and I, got, I had it down. I, I mean, I'd be on the side of the highway. I could change that thing out in a matter of about five minutes. I could change that clutch assembly. I really could. Three radios. One quit, one got stolen, the other one worked great until I, actually, I guess there's four radios. There was the factory, right? But hey, you're a teenage guy. You're not going with the factory radio. You got to put something cool in there, right? So that's what I did. And of course, there was also the complete engine overhaul. <laughs> so, 
You see, not only did I learn how to drive a standard, I also learned how to work on one. So I guess you could say that I learned some of that street smart because of this truck. But here's the worst part of all this. Here's the absolute worst thing that happened and the point where I learned my lesson and maybe learned it a little too well. As now I do a lot of research before I buy anything to make sure that I'm getting the best price for the best product. I mean, I will do it with diamonds and I'll do it with Legos. It doesn't matter, right? I'll do it with either. But the worst part of this is that not even a month later, I found a 1985 Jaguar XJS with all leather interior, less miles, and an absolutely beautiful dark green color. And they only wanted $400 more than where my truck was. And although it was not the XJ220, it was still a very, very nice ride. Sadly, I had to stop looking. I had to stop. And I had to listen to my dad tell me, Chad, I love you but I told you so. <laughs> you see, I am afraid I have just described the way that some of us have chosen to live our lives. We make decisions without much thought. We're so concerned with the immediate that we forget to think about the consequences. We either don't listen to the wisdom around us or we surround ourselves with people who convince us that wrong is right and right is wrong. We might even overestimate our ability to say no. You see, I believe with all that is in me that if we are going to make the most of the life that God has given to us, we are going to have to exercise wisdom. We're going to have to. And this is why we're doing this series. We're doing this series so we know where to turn for wisdom, to gain wisdom, and to learn how to apply wisdom to our lives. But before we go much further, let's join our hearts in prayer, seeking God's wisdom for us this day. Let's pray. God of wisdom and grace, we humbly come before you now in this moment, Lord. And God, we open our lives to you. We open our hearts to you. And God, we ask that in this moment as we hear from your word, as we hear you speak, God, we ask that you'd remove any barriers that we may have brought into this place that's going to stop us from experiencing you and learning your wisdom. So God, we ask that you be present with us in this time. And that, God, that you would always guide us, apart from this place, to be the people that you've called and created us to be. And the church said, amen. As I said before, I think God has created us to experience the fullness of life. This is what we see in Jesus, right? So God wants us to live a life that makes a difference and has a deep meaning, right? And if we're honest, that's what most of us want for ourselves, right? We want a life that has deep meaning and, that, and that, that, that makes a difference. That's why we're worried about our legacy, if you will. But there's a fundamental truth that we all need to understand. And hear this fundamental truth. God may have a will for our lives, but so do we, right? And many times in our lives, that creates moments of friction when God's will is rubbing up against our will. In the Old Testament, there are five books known as the books of wisdom. There's Job, there's Ecclesiastes, there's Psalms, there's Song of Solomon, and there's Proverbs. And these are all considered writings that communicate insights and understanding about how the world around us works and how we are to live in light of the truths. You see, much like modern day philosophical writings, they address everything. I mean, they talk about the problem of evil in the world. And then they go all the way to mundane activities like navigating friendships or handling money. And the uniqueness of the biblical accounts, however, is that the writers insisted, they insisted that God was and still is the source of all of our wisdom. And aside from God, the world is utterly lost. Well, the book of Proverbs actually begins with this very idea. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, either in print or digitally, then please join me in the book of Proverbs. Now, if you're looking for Proverbs, it's going to be right in almost in the middle of your Bible. It comes right after the book of Psalms. This morning, we'll be reading from the NIV version. That's the New International Version. Once again, we are in the book of Proverbs. We're going to be looking at chapter 1. In fact, we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to go through verse 7. So Proverbs 1, 1 through 7 says this, and I invite you to listen for, for the Word of God this morning. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, 
for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Young people, listen up. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and the riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Here, verse 7 again, because this is the first step. If we're going to gain wisdom, if we're on this journey to, to, to find wisdom in our lives, we need to start here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You see, in these first six verses, Solomon shares what happens when, when we start to take this wisdom into our lives. We start to see what we can, underst we can understand uh, many different things. But Solomon says that it only starts with the fear of the Lord. If we desire wisdom, then we need to have a fear for the Lord. And this is where the street starts, smart, street smart start. I still couldn't get that. I tried many times. Now, I know what you're saying. I, I know what you're saying. You're saying that for me to be wise, I've got to fear God. That's what you're saying. That's what Solomon said. But I thought God was all loving and, and full of grace. I thought God wanted me to be in, the, in relationship with him, and, and that's why he sent Jesus. You see, it's not normal to fear those with whom you're in a relationship. You know, in today's world, we call those unhealthy relationships or, or toxic relationships. You see, I know the word fear for us conjures up images of, of fright and gloom and anxiety, right? It's like seeing a clown walking down the street and there's not even a circus in town. That's fear. I was expecting an amen on that. That's fear right there. If you don't amen that, you can talk to me after service. That's, that's scary right there. But that's fear as we know it, right? And it triggers our fight or our flight, or our freeze, or our fawn responses. However, the fear that Solomon is talking about in Proverbs 1-7 is completely different. You see, God is love, and God is full of grace, and God offers forgiveness. But we also have to recognize that God is all-powerful, and that God is just. So the fear that Solomon is talking about, it's more of a, it's more of a healthy fear, if you will, right? It's a reverence. It's seeing God for who God is. And when we do, then we truly understand God's authority in our lives. You see, I understand this more when I became a father. You see, in many ways, I want my children to fear me. I do. Not because I would hurt them or I would threaten them. However, I will admit that it's kind of fun that, you know, they're walking around completely oblivious and you jump around the corner and scare them. That's a good kind of fear. I enjoy that. I'll admit that, right? But that's not what I'm talking about right? But instead, I want them to have a healthy fear of me so that they recognize my authority. They know that when I say not to go over 20 miles an hour on the four-wheeler, they know that I'm saying that based on my love for them, that I'm basing that on my past experiences on four-wheelers. It's because of my desire to keep them safe. Hopefully they see that. They know that when I tell them that they, they need to be careful what they post on social media because it will live forever on the interwebs. They know that I'm not trying to be mean when I say that. I'm not trying to stifle their voice. But instead, I'm hoping to set them up for a healthy future. You see, the hope is that they respect my instruction and trust that everything I do, that everything that I say is rooted in my deep love for them. Now, is it easier just to give in and let them do whatever they want? You betcha. It really is. But the question is, is that loving? Is it easier just to keep a constant thumb on them and never let them have the opportunity to gain wisdom for themselves? You betcha. But the question then is, does that lead to a healthy fear? Or does that lead to the fear as we know it today? And if we're going to take our cues from God, if we're going to take our cues from God, then we have to balance love and healthy fear if we're going to gain, if we're going to live in, and we're going to impart wisdom. So do you see what I mean, church, when I talk about fear? The beginning of wisdom for all of us here today, and for those of you who are watching online, is this healthy fear, this reverence, this awe for who God is and what God has done and is doing and will continue to do. A fear of God is the right understanding of our position before him and his position before us. Did you hear that? Did you hear that key word? Before. He's ahead of. 
You see, he is the God of the universe. And we are one of seven billion people on the earth. He is immortal. And we are mortal. He is all powerful. He is omniscient. He is everywhere. And we are restricted. He is all knowing. And we are limited. You see, when we begin here, when we begin with a deep honor and a reverence for God, then we perhaps begin to make different decisions than we might make otherwise. You see, if we know that God is in charge, then we'll be more mindful of our sinful actions. If we know that God is in control, we're going to be more eager to obey his word. As I said, when we fear God, we live in awe and wonder of who he is. And wisdom will lead us to live more and more in line with God's intention for the world when we recognize how beautiful his design is. Wisdom will lead us to be generous people because it's part of God's design. Wisdom will lead us to faithful living because it's part of God's intention. And wisdom will lead us to honest living because it's a part of God's purpose for our lives. Now, hear me clearly, family, okay? Hear me clearly. Wisdom certainly does not ensure a flawless or an easy life. It doesn't. And I'm not saying that this morning. But it does increase the potential of experiencing a full life in Christ. You see, church, wisdom is the most valuable thing that we can own the most valuable thing that we can own. I'll tell you, I love to watch a show called Expedition Unknown with Josh Gates. Anybody ever seen that show? I know Leslie has. She watches it with me, so many times she didn't have a chance. It's on the Discovery Channel. It's on the Max app. But the idea is that Josh takes the stories that we've all heard, right? The stories like the disappearance of Amelia Earhart in her plane and stories that, mean not, that we might not know much about, like the white bird. Anybody heard of the white bird before? Just a couple of you heard about the white bird. Well, the white bird was the rival to the spirit of St. Louis that took off from Paris two weeks before Lindbergh, but yet was never heard from again. Well, in an episode that I watched called The Warrior Queen's Treasure, Josh chased the legend of Queen Boudicca, the legendary Celtic queen who nearly defeated the evading Romans, the Roman army about 2,000 years ago. And in his adventure to uncover the truth about this warrior queen, it took him all over England. And he finally ends up in a field with a metal detector searching for her lost treasure. It was an offering that she had made before facing the Roman army. Now, I just tell you, I love watching the faces of those guys as they are out there working that metal detector, right? They move it side to side. I mean, they are completely bored to tears. But then they hear that tone. Right? And the look on their face, man, it begins to mimic a kid at Christmas who just got his own metal detector, right? And by the way, I'd really like a metal detector for Christmas. Just throwing throwing that out there, okay? But anyways, anyways, the, 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 the tone rings and they drop everything and they begin to dig in the dirt. And on this episode, they did not find the treasure, but instead they found many coins dating back to the Roman era. And with every coin they found, they got so excited and they created in them a a deeper and deeper desire to keep them going and to find more years of research and traveling and metal detecting and digging and failure and success has all led to this point. And when they held that coin in their hand, when they held that coin in their hand, they held something of extreme value, maybe not to the world, but to them. Extreme value. You see, in a very similar way, there's extreme value in wisdom, in possessing the street smarts that will help us lead to the fullness of life. In Proverbs 3, we catch a glimpse of the extreme value of wisdom. It says this, blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. Right at the top, you're blessed. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. By wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the watery depths were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. 
preserve sound judgment and discretion. They will be life, life for you, an ornament to grace your neck. And then you will go on your way in safety and your foot will never stumble. And I love this part. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. For when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. The author compares wisdom to some of the most valuable metals and stones and, and sleep, sweet sleep in the world, right? Now, most people would do anything in their power to line their pockets with silver and gold and rubies and jewels. And many times people won't even lift a finger to be filled with godly wisdom and knowledge. So let me ask you a question. What if we have exerted so much energy and time and attention for things in the end that really don't matter? What do we really have at that point? Now let me ask you a follow-up question. What if all along we should have been striving to, to live in awe and wonder of God and allow the wisdom that comes from viewing him in this way to lead us in our day-to-day decision makings? Then what do we really have? We have wisdom. We have wisdom, which is more profitable than silver. He has a higher rate of return than gold. It is more precious than rubies. You see, this is why we need to be on a journey to discover wisdom. Not just pray for it, but actively seek out wisdom, and especially God's wisdom. You see, one of the things that I've noticed in watching Expedition and know is that many times Josh and, and those that he works with, they hardly ever find the items for which they're looking. Even after putting in hundreds of hours in research, and in some cases dedicating their lives to the journey, they end up empty-handed, or they find something for which they had not planned. Now, I don't know about you, but that's got to lead to some humility, right? I mean, to be so certain. Every time they ask him, I am positive that it's here. I am certain that it's here, 100%. It's going to be here. It's right here. I know that. And then to be so wrong. I mean, that's a recipe for humility, 100%. You see, I think the same thing happens for us on our journey for wisdom. There's an old Spanish proverb that says, a wise man changes his mind. A fool never will. You see, family, the telltale sign of a humble person is when they are willing to admit that they are wrong. In biblical times, this is called repentance. And there's something powerful that happens when we're willing to repent, when we're willing to to turn around, to, to go the opposite direction of our old ways and turn to live in line with God's way of living. Scripture, in fact, tells us that we become new people. We begin to look more and more and more like Jesus Christ. And that's our goal, right? The book of Proverbs speaks of this as a way of finding mercy and grace as well. Proverbs 28, 13, and 14 says this. It says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And blessed is the one who always trembles before God, who has that fear, that reverence, that awe, that wonder for God. But whoever hardens the heart falls into trouble. You see, wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. In order for us to fully experience any other way of wisdom, we first have to repent. We have to turn around. We must confess the ways that we have gotten it wrong, and we need to renounce the sin in our lives. And this is the way to the life that God wants for us. So let me take it to the streets. Literally, let me take it to the streets. How many of you all use GPS in your car to get to a place that you've never been before or something you're not familiar with? How many of you all use GPS? Man, first service had more people. I really figured you guys, you guys just know everything, right? You know where you're going? Okay. I will admit that I use GPS on my phone, which then it connects into my truck. I can see the map right there on the deal. I use it all the time. I even use it in Bartlesville. I lived here 17 years. I still use it to get around Bartlesville. In fact, I used it just the other day to pick Cameron up from a friend's house. But we try and follow the directions given. But along the way, what do we do, right? We miss a turn. Maybe we take an exit before we should. And when this happens, we are informed of our mistakes when we hear that one beautiful word. Recalculating. Recalculating. I'm really waiting for the day that she says something other than recalculating, right? But we hear that word. And then we're given a new set of directions to help us get back on track. Now the fool will argue with the GPS or turn off the phone completely. And I will admit 
that I had been that fool from time to time. And the result of that was a constant wandering of no end in sight. Rather, if we are wise, when we find that we have gone astray, there's time for recalculating. And we obey the new instructions and repent so that we might find the right route once again. But here's the joy for us today, church. There's absolute joy in this. We are not alone on this journey for wisdom. You see, we have Jesus who understands our temptations and our suffering. And no matter how foolishly we have lived in the past, we can come before him and we can ask for forgiveness and be accepted and be redeemed and and given a chance to start over. So today, today I want to invite you to practice wisdom. Practice wisdom. Begin right here. Stand before God in humility with awe and wonder. Confess your, your sinful and your selfish ways. Repent and choose to follow God all your days. So today, as we think about living in this healthy fear, this deep respect for who God is and what God has done, I want us to turn our attention to Holy Communion. Because I think that it's in Holy Communion that we get a glimpse into the wisdom of God's plan for us.